<laughs> All right, I'm Laura Gothier, and I'm going to talk to you about how to get better genotype calls. So a lot of projects are just concerned with variant discovery. They want to know, is this site variant in my samples or not? And that's about it. But in medical and population genetics, we actually care about the genotypes for our samples, because these are useful when you're doing analyses for patients. You want to know, does my patient have two copies of a loss of function mutation? And they don't have a protein, that's a problem. Um, are the parents of my affected child um, carrying multiple copies of the allele? Because that's going to affect whether they have more affected children in the future. And then this is important when you do association studies too, because you want to know how many copies of the allele each individual has so that you can base your estimation of a quantitative phenotype on the dosage of that allele. And so the bad news is that the calls that come out of the haplotype caller directly are not always that reliable. So there'll be a very small subset that have low quality, meaning they're sort of ambiguous, and there'll be an even smaller subset that are flat out wrong. Um, and it's a problem. So what we want to do is we want to use independent data in the form of allele frequency from some other large cohort, like thousand genomes. Or if you have orthogonal sequencing data from a family member, namely the parents of the sample you're interested in, then we can use this data to apply priors to our genotypes to get better posterior genotype probabilities. And so this is going to be another of those preliminary analyses that come after you do your full best practices workflow. Um, it's going to work on your recalibrated variants. And unfortunately, right now, it's not in the production pipeline, but we hope it will be soon. And we highly, highly recommend that you run it yourself if you're interested in getting better genotype <coughs> calls. So this is an overview of the tools in the genotype refinement workflow. Uh, we're going to start out with those recalibrated variants from the VQSR. And then we can apply population priors and family priors, if we have data for that, put those into calculate genotype posteriors, which is a relatively new tool. And then we're going to use variant filtration to take out genotypes that have low genotype qualities. And then finally, as an example of an analysis that you can do at the end of this pipeline, we're going to tag possible de novo mutations in trios, which is something Yossi mentioned earlier. So let's start out with population priors and see what we can do with those. So earlier today, we talked about phase rule, but it's worth reviewing just because we're going to talk about posteriors a lot. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, say you're sitting at your desk in your office in the morning, and your coworker comes in with an umbrella. So given this information, what's the probability that it's raining outside? Ordinarily, you'd say that the likelihood or the probability um, of seeing the umbrella, given that it is raining, is pretty high. Because especially since we're in Boston, and spring is coming, it rains all the time. But what if we were in San Diego, and it's summer, where it almost never rains, so it's not and so in that case, the prior probability of rain is actually quite low. And so once you apply a likelihood by this low prior probability, it's going to greatly reduce the posterior probability that it's raining. So in the Southern California scenario, maybe your coworker is just using the umbrella because she's fair-skinned and she doesn't want to get sunburned. So here's an IGB screenshot showing sort of the whole flow of the genotype posteriors. So at the top, we have the original call from the haplotype caller, which is homozygous variant in the sample. And then our next track is the allele frequency from 1,000 genomes, which in this case is very low, it's 0.2%. So when we do the calculations with this tool, the posterior genotype call for the sample is actually now heterozygous. And that's in agreement with um, this track from the NIST genomes in the bottle, and we can also see the same evidence in the reads from the BAM. So we took the original genotype likelihoods, which were only GQ3 and in favor of homozygous variant genotype call. We applied this low allele frequency prior, and then the posterior genotype is now heterozygous, which is correct, and the genotype quality has improved <coughs> from 3 to 27. And here's an example with high allele frequency priors in the population data. So at the top, we have a heterozygous call in our sample. In this case, we apply 98.7% alternate allele frequency, which leads to a correct homozygous variant genotype. And when we started out, this sample's likelihoods were very ambiguous. It was actually GQ0, split between heterozygous or homozygous variant. Again, we pretty much have no idea how many copies of this allele this person has. It's at least one, but that's not good enough. So we apply these priors, and given the information from the population, 
We can say with much higher confidence that this is homozygous variant, which is correct. And we've improved the GQ from GQ0 to 16. And so this is a graph showing um, the evaluation of groups of genotype calls at each genotype quality. And then we evaluated their accuracy against truth data. So it's very similar to the BQSR plots that you saw this morning. Um, and so what we see here on the top for homozygous reference calls, we see that the baseline calls in red are actually underconfident. So their empirical validated genotype quality is higher than what we reported. So we apply priors and the posteriors in green are much closer to that one-to-one -one empirical reported line. And conversely, for homozygous variant calls, we actually see that the original calls, again in red, were underconfident. We applied priors and now the posterior calls are much better calibrated. And so looking at those groups of variants by GQ, you say, yeah, that looks like a great improvement, but what's happening to each individual variant? And so here we're looking at all of these variants, although there's some overplying, and so some of the dots um, are duplicates. So there's actually a whole bunch of variants represented here. But we're looking at the baseline genotype quality coming from the haplotype collar on the x-axis, and the posterior refined genotype quality on the y-axis. And I've split them into genotypes that are correct after refinement in green, and genotypes that are incorrect in red. And so if we fit a linear regression to this data, we see that for the correct genotypes, this beautiful straight line here has an intercept of about 10. So that's equivalent to seeing a Q10 boost in genotype qualities for correct genotypes, which is great. And even better is that the incorrect genotypes don't get boosted. They just stay where they are. So if we have sequencing data from a family, from the parents of the sample in question, we can also apply family priors with this tool. So from our basic Mendelian genetic theory, a child can only inherit alleles that are present in the parent, um, given that there are no spontaneous mutations. And so there are only certain combinations of the homozygous variant, heterozygous, heterozygous or homozygous variant genotypes that are valid for all three members of the family. So, for example, if the child is homozygous reference, there are only these four combinations of valid genotypes for that family. Anything else would feature a Mendelian violation, we say. And so we can use all of this data for the whole family to inform the probability of the child taking on each one of these genotypes at um, home ref and home bar. So again, we're going to apply Bayes' rule, and here one of the factors in the prior is going to be this genotype configuration probability. And so what we're going to do is we're going to penalize any configurations of the three genotypes in the family that have Mendelian violations. And so what happens is if you have one of those configurations that features a Mendelian violation, it's going to be weighted by the probability of such a de novo mutation causing the violation, which is really quite low. It's about 10 to the minus 8. If you have two Mendelian violations, it's going to be that factor squared, which is even less likely. So this goes into the prior calculation at the bottom. And for each genotype configuration, um, we multiply that by the likelihoods the parents take on those specific genotypes, and we marginalize overall combinations, and finally arrive at the prior, or the posterior, rather, of the child genotype. And so again, we can plot the reported genotype qualities against the empirical, and we see another big improvement here, um, better calibrated genotype qualities um, in the 0 to 30 range, and a lot more high GQ genotype calls once we apply the posteriors to the family data. And I just want to point out that there's an asymptote in this graph here um, that's because we're restricted to the number of sites that we have. Because if you want to guarantee that a site is valid to an error rate of like 1 in 10,000, for example, you actually need 10,000 sites to guarantee that that's true. And so at this point, we're limited by the number of calls in our data set at each of those GPUs. So the higher quality we want to evaluate, the more data we need, and unfortunately, we just don't have that in this call set. But the takeaway message is that um, for low GQs, there's much better calibration, and we see a lot more high genotype calls. And again, we can look at each individual variant comparing the baseline GQ with the posterior after we apply the family priors. 
And here we see about a Q13 boost for correct calls and no change in incorrect calls. These are homozygous reference calls, but we see similar results for the other genotypes as well. So after applying those post, applying the priors and deriving the genotype posteriors, we want to filter out the things that are still low GQ. So we do this with the variant filtration tool. And the cutoff that we recommend is about GQ20. And so when you do math and convert that from Fred scale, what we're saying is that anything with a 1% chance of being wrong or higher, we want to throw away. It's not good quality data. We don't want to use it in our downstream analyses. So we're just going to filter that out at the sample level for each um, genotype call that has a low GQ. And so here's an example of an analysis where we use this high quality data with posteriors uh, to tag possible de novos in trios. And so de novo mutations are responsible for a wide variety of Mendelian disorders. And they're going to be in scenarios where the parents are homozygous reference, but the child actually is heterozygous. So they have one copy of an allele that's representative of spontaneous mutation. And so if we look at a whole bunch of families in our sequencing cohort, we need to make sure that the de novos that occur in the child are only in the child. They're not inherited from the parents. So we want to guarantee that the parents are both homozygous reference. And across all the samples in the cohort, we want to make sure that this allele doesn't show up too many times because it becomes very unlikely that you can have a spontaneous mutation in multiple children at the exact same location. So that sort of puts your data into question. And to do this, we're only going to use high GQ sites um, because, again, we want to guarantee that the, G the genotypes are correct for both the parent and the child. And here the posteriors are going to help us out a lot. This is an example of some real clinical data from a family with suspected de novo mutation in the child. And if we just look at the de novo mutation sites based on the raw haplotype collier genotypes, there are 417, which is honestly a lot of sites to send out for clinical validation. So if we apply population priors and we use all the data from the family as family priors, we can get this down to 17 possible de novo sites. And then after filtering, out any of those low GQ sites, now we have only eight potential high confidence de novo sites. And we can tune the population, or we can tune the family mutation prior a little bit if we want increased sensitivity or improved specificity. Um, again, like empirically, this is about 10 to the minus eight, but if you really want to make sure that you get all the possible de novos in your sample, then you can decrease that prior to be able to capture more of those sites. And so it's tuned in a very similar way that you can with the tranches of the star. So to summarize, the genotype calls that come out of the haplotype collar are pretty good, but there are some that are going to be substandard, and we can still improve those using orthogonal data from population allele frequencies and also from sequencing data of other individuals in the family. And so this is going to guarantee that you have better quality data for all your downstream Any questions? Yes? So I don't understand what's going to cause the difference in the priors for the parent parents across the many low sides, the quality of the data in the parents? So you want to know why the priors are different across different low sides? Yeah, I have a genotype for the, you know, from someone and a from, you know, you know from some 20 the parents. What's the difference? How, how is that going to change the quality of the child? Is it, are you incorporating the quality information of the genotype of the parents. So we do. So if the parent is, for example, low genotype quality and the second most, the first most likely genotype is homozygous reference and the second most likely is het, but say they're at a GQ10, then that kind of throws the genotype of the child into question because it may or may not have had the possibility of inheriting an alternate allele. But if the parent GQ is home rep, at a very high quality, then we're quite sure that there were no alternate alleles to be inherited from that side. Make sense? Yeah, I just didn't see where you were getting that information. Yeah, it comes from the, the PLs for the parent genotype calls. How long does the, the workflow run for a large call set? It's not as, so the, the runtime 
for the workflow is actually pretty quick, um, especially compared to the whole best practices. Uh, it's not very computationally intensive, and so a lot of the cost is just writing out the new GVCF or new VCF <coughs> the annotations, um, which is good because since we don't do it on the production pipeline yet, we will have to do it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So is it on the order of QSR? Like, um, it will be faster than the QSR. That's great. Yes. Yes. Um, so if you set of mixed populations and you're flowing thousand genomes at it, can you be confounded by populations with a higher level of disease? So I've done a couple different experiments. Because um, like those data that I showed were just using the whole thousand genomes, uh, a little frequencies across all ethnicities. And you, you do still see GQ improvement. If you can subset to the ethnic population that your sample belongs to. Like, for example, that was the CEU trio. And if I pull out the European priors from Thousand Genome, I can get better GQ boosts. So if you want to do it for a cohort that contains multiple ethnicities, you'd probably have to subset it and then apply the priors and then put them back together. Because the tool can't ex support that explicitly right now. Yes? So when you're like, trying to call the um, what is the threshold of your adding frequency you would have in the brand? Because sometimes one of the brands is mosaic, and so has the brand a very low frequency. So do you get rid of those, or is there a way to change the threshold to not miss those variants because you know, they might be present in the brand with very low frequency? So, how do you deal with that? so which part of the pipeline are you referring to? Uh, the very end, when you're calling the novel variants in the trio. Right, so you could potentially change those. Um, the particular thresholds that I was using, gosh, I don't remember off the top of my head, unfortunately it's not in there. Um, but if you knew that it was likely the samples uh, in your cohort did have some sort of mosaicism, but and you, you could change You don't really know, it's just that sometimes you would see like the two reads out of 100 that were actually carries around, so did you get rid of this when they're seeing the brands or not? We don't get rid of that small fraction of alternate alleles per se, but it will affect the genotype quality. Um, so the haplotype quality will take that into account when it calculates the PLs. So if you had 100% reference reads, then you would have an incredibly high GQ. Um, you know, your likelihood <coughs> would be like 0, 70, depending on what your depth is, it would be even higher, and then 300, something like that. But if you do see a small proportion of alleles, it'll probably still call home rep, but then the, the likelihood of HET will be a little bit stronger, and so you'll see a smaller difference between those genotype likelihoods, and they'll be reflected in a slightly lower GQ. But it could still be called as the your trio analysis product. You mean the, the low allele fraction? Yes, it seems seen in the birds. Would it still be able to be called as the way in child? It could potentially, it would be lower confidence, um, but given that the evidence in the parents is such a low fraction, it would lean towards a reference call on the parents, in which case it would make it look like a, like a lower confidence to know on the child. I'm just curious why in some cases I saw the baseline GQ are uh, greater than the posterior that because you were your time and you think, wow, this design is not going to last two days. So there are some sites um, in the Thousand Genomes project that have very polarized allele frequencies, either very much towards zero or very much towards 100%. And so in those cases, there's a lot of strength of evidence to, to change a genotype. So like, um, I guess the examples that I showed weren't quite that different but, yeah, so you're saying like some of these, like here where the baseline is higher. Oh. There's not that many. Yeah, some of the incorrect ones, I think the baseline is a little bit higher. Um, it's not off this line, but it's uh, yeah. definitely.
slide up. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so you, if you have an allele frequency that's closer to zero or one, it makes for much stronger prior. Um, and so then you can affect a larger GQ change, whereas if the allele frequency from your population prior is as close to 50%, it's not as strong prior. Um, so you could potentially have like huge GQ changes at some of these sites that are um, very variant in the population or very rapid. I didn't understand what the difference between the 17 and the 8. 